Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and as usual just a couple of announcements let me remind you first of all that uh, this summer and we only do this every couple of years we're doing the diet and lifestyle course and we're featuring the celebrity instructors like Dr. Peter Bregan and uh, Dr. Alan Goldhammer and Dr. Ralph Moss and Dr. Mark Schultz and um, Dr. Neil Barnard, Caldwell Esselstyn. So you won't be able to do this again for a couple of years. It really is this year and then not for another couple of years. So if you want to take this incredible class with these incredible instructors, send me an email at pampopper at msn.com and I will send you details. And we have set the schedule for the rest of the year for the new classes that we're introducing this year, thyroid, PCOS, food exercise and mental health, diabetes, cognitive health and Alzheimer's disease, the microbiome, health benefits and detrimental effects of cannabis, time management, and irritable bowel. All right, so all that is set. If you want to see the schedule, uh, it's online now. You can go to wellnessforumhealth.com. And I'm so excited. We have two new speakers for our conference. Dr. Ceres Stanzik is coming. She is a medical doctor who reversed her multiple sclerosis with diet, and she is the executive producer of Cold Code Blue. Uh, which is about medical training and uh, we're going to screen the film at our conference and we've added Dr. Gracie Yuen who has a water fasting center here in Ohio so uh, we just posted the revised flyer you can go to wellnessforumhealth.com and uh, look at the flyer and the prices go up on May 1st so this would be a good time to make a reservation for a conference. Alrighty, a couple of topics to talk about here that I think are interesting. According to a new study the key to sustaining weight loss is not restricting calories, but instead engaging in more physical activity. Researchers compared 25 middle-aged people who had lost an average of 58 pounds and kept it off for nine years, which is a pretty amazing accomplishment when you think about it, with a group of similar people who are either normal weight or overweight. And what they were really surprised to find out is that those who had maintained weight loss ate just as many calories as the overweight or obese people and more calories than the people who were normal weight. And so one of the things we try to stress with people here who are trying to lose weight is a lot of times you're not eating enough food. And people, that just sounds so counterintuitive. But anyway, these people were eating more calories than the normal weight people, and they were still maintaining 58 pounds average weight loss for nine years. The difference between the sustained weight loss group and the others was activity. Those who remained leaner took an average of 12,107 steps per day as compared to 8,935 in the normal weight group and 6,477 steps in the overweight obese group. The calorie burn indicated the equivalent of about 60 to 90 minutes a day of moderate intensity exercise or 30 to 45 minutes a day of vigorous physical activity like running. In an accompanying editorial, a couple of researchers asked, I think, some provocative questions. One is that, what motivates people to engage in such regular and vigorous exercise? And then is the second question, is their psychology different from other people? And if so, in what way? And they noted that the activity level of these individuals requires a significant commitment, which means that they might have more willpower or discipline or that their reasons for exercise go beyond just wanting to keep weight off that they lost. In other words, weight loss maintenance could possibly be a byproduct of an activity performed for other reasons. Now, I think there's reason to believe that that might be the case. Exercise has been shown to lower stress and anxiety, and a lot of people, including me, report that it improves quality of life. I think that um, uh, definitely I'm a lot less anxious and aggravated and everything else when I get a chance to exercise, and you know, more aggravated and anxious when I don't. So perhaps these individuals are exercising for these reasons, and then just a wonderful byproduct is they manage to keep the weight off. Another possibility to consider is that they started exercising in order to keep the weight off and then they found other benefits that made them want to continue to engage in the activity um, that, that caused them to continue long after the weight was lost and sort of the fear of regaining it um, had gone away. I don't know what, um, uh, I don't think we could definitively answer this question at this point in time, but I think one thing that we can say is that if you're trying to lose weight and keep it off or you're trying to be healthy, 
or stay healthy, regain your health. Exercise is really good for you, more is better. And most people don't do enough exercise. They need to do more than they're doing now. So um, if you're struggling with weight, uh, in fact, we talked about this a little bit last week, uh, increasing your physical activity is one way to get yourself out of the rut of not being able to get the scale move to move. And some people who are doing some movement need to step it up a little bit and do something a little bit more vigorous, more activity, more often every week. The other thing that I want to talk about is an update of something that I reported on a couple of years ago that was fascinating. It has to do with fecal transplant. Um, so th this is a good one for you to not necessarily be eating lunch while you're watching, okay? So a lot of traditional treatment offer, uh, options offered to autistic children are ineffective. Let's just start there. I remember being uh, part of a panel discussion concerning autism about uh, three or four years ago. And two of the panel members were a husband and wife team. Um, they were both doctors. They had an autistic child. And one of the things that they said is they expected that they were going to get the very best, air quotes around that treatment, for their son, both because they were doctors and because they had excellent insurance coverage. And they uh, reported at this panel discussion that within a pretty short period of time, they recognized that they were going to have to start looking outside of the traditional offerings if they were really going to be able to help their son. So strategies that are typical, like giving autistic children uh, psychiatric drugs and just normal speech therapy, they don't really help a whole lot. Um, and they don't address the real symptoms that cause the problems for, for kids who are on the spectrum, like, like um, socialization and repetitive behaviors. And of course, there are some physical conditions that give us a clue as to what's going on that are really common with autistic kids. And, and a lot of them have severe gastrointestinal uh, sub, uh, symptoms. So the idea that autistic behaviors is re, uh, are related in some way to the gastrointestinal tract and the microbiome, not well recognized in mainstream medicine. But having said that, there is more interest in the topic and some mainstream researchers are paying attention to it. The bacteria in our guts are, these bacteria are involved in many aspects of human function, including digestion, assimilation of nutrients, and the development and function of our immune systems. The gut bacteria are also involved in brain communication and neurological health. And by the way, the, the transportation of messages back and forth goes through the vagus nerve. A lot of it does anyway. And for a long time, we thought that all the messages were going from the brain to the gut. We now know that 90% of the messages are going from the gut to the brain. So it's not surprising to think that um, there might be a connection between uh, behaviors of autistic children and their, um, their gut microbiomes. Uh, the microbiota transfer or microbiota transfer therapy is a type of fecal transplant that was originally pioneered by Dr. Thomas Barodi, an Australian gastro gastroenterologist. Now, since many, if not most, ASD kids have gastrointestinal symptoms, often quite severe, makes some sense that if you would be able to do something to alter that microbiome, you might see some improvement. So it wasn't surprising that two years ago, a research group reported that they took a group of autistic kids, they did a fecal transplant, and the children got better during eight weeks of follow-up. Um, just recently published, longer follow-up with the same subjects now shows that the improvements that these kids experienced in the beginning continued and the patients got better over time. After two years, improvements in gastrointestinal symptoms remained and parents were reporting a continual reduction in symptoms specifically associated with autism. Professional evaluation showed a 58% reduction in gastrointestinal symptoms and a 45% reduction in symptoms like language, social interactions, and specific behaviors during this two-year time period. At the start of the study, just to give you some perspective, 83% of the children were rated as having severe autism. At the two-year follow-up evaluation, only 17% of the kids were still considered severe, 39% were rated as mild-moderate, and 44% were below the threshold for diagnosis of mild ASD. The researchers initially reported that the transplant improved bacterial diversity and increased the populations of beneficial bacteria such as bifidobacteria. After two years, bacterial diversity and the populations of these types of bacteria had improved even more. 
Many of the participants in this trial shared common medical history that explained the condition of their microbiomes. These included C-section birth, reduced or absent breastfeeding, increased use of antibiotics, and lower fo fiber intake of both the children and their mothers. All families completed the study and 100% of them returned for the two-year follow-up, and I think that that goes to, um, is a pretty important indicator of the efficacy. So obviously more research is needed. One study doesn't make the case, and more widespread availability of fecal transplant is needed too, because at this point in time, the only thing that, uh, the only condition for which fecal transplant is approved is people who have C. diff infection Unfortunately, anybody else has to be part of a clinical trial. So we can hope that some pressure may be brought to bear on the FDA to approve um, the use of fecal transplant for people who have conditions other than uh, just um, uh, C. diff infection. So anyway, I'll keep reporting on it. I'm hoping that these researchers continue to follow up. One other thing I'll add uh, to this study that is uh, very interesting to me anyway is that typically what I've seen and what parents have reported to us over the years is that um, children who are where the intervention starts shortly after diagnosis, um, the parents are looking for alternatives and dietary intervention and probiotics and really intense behavioral therapy, when it starts right away, um, the children have a better chance of, of improvement than um, if the children have been autistic for a long period of time and then intervention starts. Well, in this study, many of these kids were what, older, like as old as 12 years old and had not shown any improvement during that period of time, and they still showed improvement. That's the first time I've seen anything published indicating that kids in that age range actually got better. So this is really promising and something to pay attention to, and the reason that I bring it up um, again here is because so many people who watch this YouTube channel have children with um, who have autism spectrum disorder issues and um, uh, you know may be able to get into a trial like this if they know this information. All right, hit the subscribe button as usual. Pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.